There we go. So now we are officially live on Zoom. Hi, all my Zoomers. And we're live on YouTube, which is also great. Let's see, there we go. Now I don't have an echo. I'm on an echo chamber. And we're going to lift up, we're going to lift up the computer so that I can stare at both my uh, Facebook computer and uh, my Zoom computer at the same time. I'll say hello to Allison. I'll say hello to everyone watching on, uh, on Facebook and on YouTube. And uh, we're just about to begin. So that is amazing. Uh, what I'll do is I'm going to come off my, there we go. Fantastic. Okay, well, wait a moment. Uh, as you are watching on Facebook and on Zoom and on YouTube, uh, let's just take a moment to sort of recap. We had three weeks where we described what uh, what makes art Jewish, uh, why what Jewish art can do in a person's home. Uh, imagine, you know, your kids. Uh, coming into the dining room, and instead of just a, a floral, which is nice, florals are nice. I mean, paintings of flowers or sceneries, which are all always nice. But instead, they see a beautiful picture of the koisel. Uh, that's a statement. It's a statement. You, when you put up art, you're you're making a statement. You're saying this is, uh, this is what I represent. This is to me. It's pleasing to look at. Uh, I will tell you that uh, we had a a painting that we put up in our kitchen and it was a beautiful painting, gorgeous of the Kaisel. And it was the Kaisel people walking there to uh, Davin in the morning, holding tefillin and the kids as they're eating breakfast, they are staring front and center at the Kaisel, the Western wall. That's inspiring. That's something that's worthwhile. So if you want to take a moment and, uh, pop onto the Zoom, you'll be able to actually see the art that I'm talking about. And um, and if not, then you'll just be able to take notes. Um, but we, we're uh, we going to begin now. And uh, and this is the last class in uh, Jewish art. It's Jewish art, how to invest in Jewish art. So the, question number one, is Jewish art investable? It's a very legitimate question. Now, we know that we don't own anything in this world. We don't own anything. We're just holding on to it for the next person. You have a Rolex watch, you enjoy it, but eventually you give over that Rolex watch to the next person. You don't really own it. You don't, you don't own it. Or things that you do own, like a car eventually collapses and you know it, 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 it gets worn out. The motor gets, uh, gets worn out. So... We don't really own anything. However, if there is something that's in your possession and you're able to enjoy it, and then eventually you can sell it, so then you'll have that money for the next thing. Now, things like uh, cars depreciate very quickly. I think the moment you take it out of the showroom, I don't remember the percentage, but you know, 15%, just off the bat, it's no longer a new car. It's a used car. It'll have a second owner, and it goes downhill from there. Most things in life. Hi, David. Welcome. Hello, Rabbi. How are you? Nice to see you. Baruch Hashem. Baruch Hashem. Hello. We're welcome to everyone on Zoom, everyone on YouTube, and everyone on Facebook. So some things just, they, they depreciate in value. You have a pair of shoes. Those shoes are going to get worn out, and they're just not worth that much money. Investment usually means that I'm going to buy it, I'll own it, and then eventually I'll actually be able to one day cash it in and make uh, make money or at least get my money back. Now, that's a total win-win. You can enjoy having it, and then you could then either make money or at least recoup your money. Wow, that's the way to go. So most things live do not work like that. You own it, and then they go down in value. You have a nice silk tie. You paid a lot of money. You could find it in the thrift store for four bucks. You know, uh, that's that's how things are. But uh, art has the potential of you owning it 
and then eventually it can go up and you'll have the pleasure of owning it. You'll be able to wa- see it on your wall. You'll feel really nice about it. And then eventually you'll sell it and actually have cash in your pocket. So can you, can one make money on Jewish art? Now, I'm going to just jump to the end and then I'll explain to you why this is true. The answer is absolutely yes. Uh, Jewish art, uh, Jewish art, although it seems like it has a niche audience, like only Jewish people would buy Jewish art, that's not actually the case. First off, uh, there are a lot of people around the world who enjoy different forms of Jewish art. Uh, For example, Israeli art, which may not be overtly Jewish, but uh, it has uh, it it is made by a Jew and may have some Israel content are are sold and bought in China, for example. They're brought to California. Many people buy it, and I even know of a seller who makes most of his money on Jewish art, selling them to non-Jewish people. So there definitely is an audience out there for non uh, for, for Jewish art, even in the non-Jewish audience. But because of something that we spoke about in the beginning of our class, you know, a few weeks ago, because there is a dearth, there is not enough real quality Jewish art that's out there. And the Jewish population, especially the affluent Jewish population is growing. The Orthodox Jewish population is also growing. And many of them very much want the overt Jewish imagery in their home. So there absolutely is money to be made. I met um, a fellow yesterday who said that his friend just built a house and spent over $70,000 on art to adorn his home. Now, that may sound very ostentatious, but the ch- but the chances are if he invested wisely, and investing wisely means to speak to somebody who knows about art, uh, who understands investment in art, he's going to make 70,000 plus back. He may make much more than that. So when I started in Jewish art years ago, so I, I, I started with, with lithographs, not much to be made with lithographs. Those are prints. We spoke about that. And then I sort of graduated to actual art at the advice of my rabbi, who said it's better to invest in the real thing. People are going to be interested in it. And um, for me, I was never able to actually buy at top end. So to me, it was a little bit of a treasure hunt, whether it was through auctions or through uh, developing a friendship with the artist. I have a friendship with many of the big artists out there. I learned that from my grandfather. He was friends with many uh, very big artists and and they were more than happy to um, to uh, make works for him and not look to uh, break the bank on his shoulders. And even more than that, they would sell directly to either me or to my grandfather or my great grandfather did the exact same thing. and. Very often, there's like a middleman, like an art broker, and the art broker hikes up the price. You wouldn't believe how much the art broker hikes up the price. I will tell you, this is going to make you shudder, okay? If you're watching this, it's going to make you shudder. There is typical art that is painted that the artist himself gets between $1,500 and $2,000 on each piece, and the broker takes $10,000. He, it's not double, it's not triple, it's, it's quintuple. And that is like an industry standard. It's it's crazy. It's one of the reasons why when I sell art, I try to do it wholesale simply because it's 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 Geneva. I'm sorry to say it. Geneva means it's you're stealing, you're ripping. It just, it's just, it's not a nice thing to do. And it could even be halachically problematic because according to Jewish law, there, there is a concept uh, of, of taking too much money profit. There is such an idea. So um, I've developed friendships with artists and I've gotten to know them personally. And uh, even if even if I never bought anything from them, I like to meet people who are creative and very often very passionate people because they're very interesting people to, to, to make as friends. So... There was one artist that I invested in years ago. His name is Alex Levine. Now, Alex Levine uh, was discovered by uh, Hollywood. 
So he was purchased by uh, Madonna, Richard Greer. And eventually I saw his art and I thought, wow, it's not um, abstract. It's a little more what I like to call obvious art, but why not? Obvious art could be, obvious art could be beautiful. Why, why, why not obvious art? What's the problem with obvious art? So, so um, I, I reached out to Alex Levine. It turns out he lived in Israel. He is originally Russian. Let me see if I can uh, share, uh, you know, he, uh, share an image or two of his. I think it would be very nice. Yeah, he won. He won a lot of really, uh, really nice awards, and um, and he's he's very talented, and uh, and I invested in his stuff. I loved his Israel paintings, and let's see. Okay, here we go. We're gonna share. Uh, we're gonna share a painting of his. I'm sorry if you're on uh, uh, Facebook, you can't see it. Can you guys see that? You can see that. Yeah. Can you see? Okay. So like, uh, let's see. Yes, we can see it. You can see that. Okay, fantastic. Okay, so let's see. Here's Jerusalem. There you go. It's a little, a little on the obvious side. His colors are beautiful. Um, right? There's like a sort of a stained glass piece. Very, very beautiful stuff, Alex Levine. And uh, I develop a friendship with him. And then it turns out, yeah, I'm going to stop the share. And then it turns out that his brother lives in Staten Island and is a musician. So we share music together. And uh, his prices have kept going up. And yet I was able to get them when he was just starting in the industry. So that's something one can do with art. Now, I will tell you something about Alex Levine. And uh, I, I think this is something you wouldn't know if you're just going to the, to the gallery to buy a piece, but it's something that I, I know because I do follow trends and I do follow artists. A, a guy like Alex Levine, whose art is very sort of obvious, not that abstract. He was really good. And uh, the, the art was, it was well-made. And after a while, I stopped investing in him. And the reason why is I felt that he stopped growing as an artist. Now, we all have to continue growing in our craft. Whether you're a lawyer, whether you're a doctor, my dad's a doctor and he takes tests every five years. And if he wants to keep his license, he's got to keep taking, I don't know if there's such a thing, if lawyers have to do a similar thing, they do. I know doctors have, yeah. Yes, every two years we have to keep up with uh, continuing legal education credits. Ah, okay, so there you go. You can't stay stagnant. You can't rest on your laurels. And artists have that same issue. They could rest on their laurels. They could just say, oh, wow, I make, I make nice art and people are buying it. And you don't grow as an artist. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not saying this to badmouth him. I'm saying this to praise him because along came COVID and something happened to him. I think his brother also was influential in pushing him to really improve his craft. And he, he has taken off his new stuff. I, I've been waiting 10 years for him to keep on developing his art and his art has actually gotten a lot nicer. So price-wise, an Alex Levine, when I bought it, uh, when I when I bought Alex Levine, maybe, uh, was it maybe 12, 12, 13 years ago, I was paying 2,000, 2,500 for a piece. Now they're about seven, 8,000. So that's not bad. It's, you know, it's three times as much in 12 years. I think that's a pretty good investment, right? And, th and there's a lot of room for growth. Uh, uh, there's another artist, and, I, and I'm sharing with you these because this is our last class, and I think these are good names for you to have under your belt. This artist is incredibly hot, and I mentioned him last week. Remember, I or two weeks ago, remember I spoke about those pillars, those stained glass pillars? So those stained glass pillars were, were made by an artist named Tzvi Rafaeli, and uh, he's a very, very talented 
artist. I'm going to show you uh, one piece of Rafaeli so we can get a proper uh, appreciation for Rafaeli. There we go. Let's see. Okay, let's let's share this. Okay, we're going to share our screen. Could you guys see that? Yes. Okay. It's pretty, right? Very nice. Very nice. So Rafaeli, when I when I bought Rafaeli's uh, again about 10, 12, 13 years ago, uh, I paid three four hundred dollars a piece for them. Now Rafaeli is about three to five thousand dollars each. So they've gone up ten times in price. And actually, if you go on to eBay, uh, which you know, we can speak a little bit about how accurate eBay is in terms of trends, but uh, people are already asking up to seven, eight, nine, ten thousand for their Rafaelis, and I paid three hundred bucks for them. Now, what was interesting was that when when I was able to identify that this person's a worthwhile investment, I told my friends, "Invest in this guy; you're going to make money." and Although I was more of a novice at that time, but I, I understood trends and most of them didn't listen. And it was a chaval. It was a pity because they, they would have made, you could have made a lot of money. You could have, I don't know how many investments you could make 10 times as much in a span of, you know, 13 years or 12 years, whatever it ended up being. So that that's a really good name to know. So I think I mentioned this in one of the other classes, but let's just sort of to, to review and because we're speaking about investments, how do we know if an artist is investable? Is it their craft? Is it how talented they are? What makes an artist worthy of investment? So the answer is going to disappoint. The answer is, in general, it has nothing to do with how talented the person is. It's very sad to hear. It has to do with the gallery that's pushing the artist. It's all about PR. When there's a gallery that, that is willing to spend money on calendars, right? for example, they give out distributed calendars on every page. One side is a calendar. I'm sure you must have seen calendars like this. Uh, one side is a calendar. The other side is the piece of art. And a person is staring at that art throughout the month because the calendar is just up there. And then they flipped the month. And again, there's another piece of art. So before you know it, people say, wow, this is a real name. This is a real person. Uh, in, in Jewish art, uh, one of the gold standards, going to make you laugh. One of the gold standards is the Passover Haggadah. The Haggadah is one of the most famous books in Judaism, Haggadah. We have Haggadah, we read it every Pesach. And an artist who is good, he, if he can get himself into a, a Haggadah so that his stuff is published, so that is one of the hallmarks of art becoming expensive. Uh, I have pieces in my home that were that were not purchased for that much, but are worth a tremendous amount because they were published in Agada. Uh, I have a, a painting of the four sons of Agada, and it's worth about thirty-five thousand today. But I didn't pay anything like that. But once you become published in Agada, that is that breaks the bank. So you need somebody pushing you. So let me tell you a typical story that happens to me very often. Very often, people call me and they say, Rabbi, I know you deal in art. I'm an artist. How do I sell my art? That's a hard question to answer. How do, you, how do I sell my art? And I'm sure there are people who are, who are watching and they say, uh, and they say, hi, hi, Rabbi Bluch. They say, um, uh, you know, I make these paintings. And then sometimes they'll even say, I say, did you ever sell any piece? They'll say, yeah, a person once paid me $2,000 for a painting. That's the worst thing to happen, right? If there's an artist who sold one piece for 2000 because what happens is that artist becomes very unrealistic in what their art is worth, and they expect $2,000. And now I'm going to vent a little because it's our last class. There are some artists who 
they're not investable, not just because they don't have somebody uh, pushing their art, but because they're just not great artists. So if you are an artist listening to this, and if you're going to be on YouTube uh, and you're going to listen to this another time, not live, remember this. If you want to be a good artist to sell your stuff, you have to be good at sketching. You've got to know how to sketch. You could be sure that even the uh, strange images that Picasso made, he was an amazing sketch artist and he was able to paint like Rembrandt. He chose not to. He went into cubism. He tried different, but he knew how to sketch. And that ability to, uh, at, at your core, actually be an artist becomes something that is seen in your work even if the work that you paint seems more, I don't want to say childish, but more naive and more abstract. It doesn't make a difference. Your ability to actually, if you needed to take a pencil to paper, you could sketch a magnificent portrait of a person. And what's happened is, and I'm going to end my rant with this. What's happened is that a lot of wannabe artists have seen the afterwork of some accomplished artists that seem more abstract and they jump straight to the abstract stuff and they don't really know how to sketch. So there's a huge difference between being an artist who can legitimately paint and yet you're working abstracts and an artist who is an utterly naive artist who can't really draw, but they put colors together and wonder, hey, what's the difference between my work and their work? There's a huge difference. And anyone knows art can see, you know, one's an artist and one is a wannabe. So learn how to sketch, learn how to sketch. Uh, David, I want to thank you. You just sent me books. One of the books was a sketch. I don't know if you saw that book. Mm -hmm. My kids were all excited how to sketch faces, portraits. See, I looked at the looked at that. My kids are all excited. Okay, learn how to sketch. Really important. Now, you need to have a gallery that pushes. So I'm going to give you a great example of an artist who happens to be a very talented artist. But if you are Jewish, especially part of the Frum Haredi community, you have heard of this artist. You have heard of her. And her stuff is worth a mint. Okay? The name is Huvi. Hoovy, H-U-V-Y, Hoovy. I've sold Hoovies. I have Hoovies. What's a what's a nice Hoovy oil worth? A big nice Hoovy oil, <coughs> sixty, seventy, hundred thousand dollars, hundred fifty thousand. What? I mean, her stuff is great. My wife loves it, and it, it is compelling. There's no question. You could Google the words Hoovy Alicia. That's her last name, Alicia, H-U-V-Y, Alicia, E-A-L-I-S-H-A. Uh, she is the most delightful, most delightful elderly lady. She lives of all places in Maya Sharim, in the, the most Haredi place in the world. And she's up there and she she paints. This was, she must be in her 90s now. And, and you can see a video of her. You go, Google her online. She's just a, a spectacular human being. But hundred thousand dollars like really she could take a a, a, a brush she's alive thank god she should live till 120 but she could take a brush that's like you're you're painting dollar bills like many many how are you doing this so this is exactly what i'm saying she had a gallery push her now her gallery had the best pusher of all it was her son and he did something quite brilliant the entire gallery is devoted to her work. So unlike most galleries, which have sort of a collection and a collected collection, if you go to Israel, you go to Hoovy's gallery and you buy a Hoovy and you get the Hoovy experience. And uh, they, the lighting is awesome over there. The paintings really are nice. Her use of color is just beautiful. I think she's from France originally. Um, but... She was pushed and pushed. And not only are her paintings pushed, but uh, the, the the gallery will not negotiate on price. So when they kept going up and up, 
you know, people said, well, wow, $50,000 is a lot for that little painting. It's still alive. How about 30? And they, and they just like kicked you out. Like, no, it's 50 or nothing. So uh, I don't know how many people can get away with that, but Hoovy's gallery has gotten away with it. So if you are into investing and you've got a lot of money uh, and you want to buy a Hoovy, buy a Hoovy. I don't really think you're going to lose money at this point unless you pay a premium. There are ways, again, contact me. I'll, you know, I, I have all the connections. I can show you how to get them as cheap as you can, but uh, even inexpensive is expensive for a Hoovy. That's just the reality. The, um, what I would say, and th this is going to be just our entrance way into how to invest. What I would say is go for, original paintings, not lithographs, and look for the $10,000 and under, preferably a lot under. Look for the 2000, the three, the four, with certain criteria that are indicators that they're going to go up. Now, I'm, by the way, I'm only speaking about live artists today. We're, uh, right now, I'm going to speak about artists that have passed away very soon. Now I'm just speaking about live uh, artists who are, who are alive today. Uh, by the way, another artist who's done a great job promoting herself is an artist named Yali. Yali, uh, I just met someone. Oh, do you have Yali's? Like, why Yali? Why not other artists? But there's very good uh, promotion going on and it makes a difference. So what you want is like this. You want to find an artist who has not started going up like crazy or whose prices haven't uh, risen dramatically over a brief period of time. Like you don't want to get the GameStop of art. You don't want it because you, you're, you're going to spend a lot and then you want to sell it, you're going you're gonna to take a loss. So you want to you find somebody who's in the, you know, I would say even two to six range with the potential of in a few years to be, you know, 12 to 20. And that's a very nice investment. If you get someone who's six and they're going to be 12, 13, 14, you've doubled your money and you've enjoyed the art on your wall the whole time. Wow. What a great, what a great way to go. Uh, and that's really, in my opinion, especially for the lay person who doesn't have like $100,000 to spend on a UV, uh, that's going to be your sweet spot. And if you can, you get even less expensive like these Raphaelis, but artists that are on the way up. So how do you know who's going to go up? So simple answer is you don't really know. It's hard to know who's going to go up. But if they're properly promoted, that's number one, properly promoted. Number two, they have to have skill. They need to have skill. At the end of the day, in the end of the day, art and different artists can be fad like. They can be, there could be a fad, there, there, you know, movement to buy this artist, but there's no staying power if there isn't skill. And if you, Look for skill. I'll give you an, a, an example of an artist with tremendous skill. Um, the artist's name is Boris Dubrov. Boris Dubrov. Let, let me just pull him up. Dubrov. Boris Dubrov, I think, is probably, is probably, uh, I would say, he's the most skilled uh, realistic artist today. Uh, realistic means... Uh, traditional art. Uh, yeah, let's take a moment. I'll take a moment and uh, sort of blow this up for you. Here you go. We're going to share Dubrov for a moment so you should see who I'm talking about. Let me share this screen. Okay. Okay. This is a very fuzzy photograph. Uh, it's, it's not a high resolution photograph, so you can't really see the detail, but you see the crochet, the, the tablecloth, the wood. This person technically is a genius. And it's that kind of art that will stand the test of time. A lot of the art that 
people are buying today. Uh, number one, there's questionable skill. Number two, it, the, the, a lot of the color that people are looking for, it's beautiful, but almost to the point of gaudy. And it's not stuff that's going to stand the test of time. I don't believe does anyone, oh, I'm going to, I have to call David again. I'm so sorry to do this to you. But do you remember in the 1960s and 70s, in the old synagogues and temples, the there was a certain style and the like the, the carpet was like a low car, low cut orangish carpet, like a, like a, like a people. Yeah. It just, and everything had sort of, um, a, a laminate. It, it's just it, it was an. It, it looked like Brady Bunch stuff. It really <laughs> had that. It and people thought it was the coolest thing from that era. The only thing that really stood the test of time for collectors were some of the furniture. Some of the furniture that the curvy white silicone for that. It's actually, stood, but a lot of the other stuff has not really stood the test of time, and. Gaudy colors, while we may like color, it's hard to imagine they're going to stand the test of time. But look for skill. Number three, look for traditional art. You want to invest. Let me give you a great example of a non-traditional art that people are buying, which, again, just me speaking, I don't think it's going to stand the test of time. There's an artist named Agam, A-G-A-M. And Agam's art has sort of like almost like a three-dimensional quality. Uh, there are people who collect them. Uh, there, he has something called an, an agamogram. Uh, okay, well, I'll have to show you what a Agam looks like <laughs> just because we like to, let's see, just because we like to show you exactly what we're talking about. Agam artist. Okay, here we go. So we're going to take uh, a piece of art. This is this is a piece from Agam. Here we go. Share the screen. And here you've got Agam. It's Agam. It's got a three-dimensional quality. He's an Israeli artist. And people, you know, people buy it. And this website selling this, for example, they're selling this for $3,000. The thing is like this, at the end of the day, people want to in, people want to invest in things that they know have a history of selling and skill and the traditional beautiful stuff has a much better chance than the technical stuff. This is my opinion and that's that's I, I'll, I'll stand by that and uh, in my own personal when I buy something it'll be as traditional as can be. Now it doesn't mean I won't buy color or abstract. Of course we know Monet and Manet and, and others uh, in those days may have been considered kitsch and today people, people like it. Thank you MoMA uh, right? Thank you. I'm sorry. Thank you Blair who is uh, who is mentioning, uh, thank you. Very good. So th that's actually a really good question. So if something shows up in MoMA, does that make it a, does that make it investable? To a degree, to a degree, it's hard to know. Certainly, if you're paying not a lot of money, I would say the way to go is uh, to stay with, with traditional art. Now, next. There are American artists, and we mentioned this in one of the previous classes, who they're American Jewish artists, meaning they painted Jewish paintings, but they painted a lot of American paintings, meaning American scenery and workers and unions and war paintings, but they also paint the Jewish art. But because they were American painters, they sold, or I'm sorry, they hang in American museums. So you'll be able to find these paintings in the Smithsonian and in the Met and in the Chicago Museum of Art. So now you've got two things going for you. You've got a Jewish painting and you'll have the Jewish audience that wants to buy it. And you'll have the 
non-Jewish audience wants to buy his art because they're listed and they hang in museums. Now, I'm going to give you a great example of this. An artist that I am recommending, it's on my buy list right now. And I actually have a story about this artist. The artist's name is Irving Amen. Amen, spelled like Amen, spelled the same way. A-M-E-N, Irving Amen. Uh, a wonderful artist. Uh, let's see, we have to share one more screen. Again, I apologize to my uh, uh, to my uh, people who are looking uh, on Facebook. Irving. Okay, Irving Amen. Let's see if we get a nice Irving Amen. Okay, I, I was looking at one one site. Let's just do it this way, Irving Amen. Okay, now Irving Amen was an artist, and he was also a sculptor. He was a sculptor, very, very good artist. And I will show you a, a piece of his that I acquired recently. And I think it, it's telling, uh, here we go. We're gonna share this and you'll see, uh, you'll see a little bit of what kind of art it is. Okay, let's see, can you guys see? Oh, it's sold, of course, I should know that where it was sold to. Okay, could you guys see? Uh, I can't click on it. So could you see that or is yes. it covered? You can see it. Okay. For yeah. me, it's okay. Uh, very human, cubit, colors. He just he's, he's, He was a stunning artist. Um, a lot of these that you see over here, they're wood blocks. So they're not original. But here, take a look. Can you see that the chess players? Yeah, you guys see that? Okay. So Irving Amen, he was an artist who painted Jewish scenes. Uh, he was a humanist. He was a tremendous person. And his art, till recently, were going for a few hundred dollars. Today, uh, the Irving the Irving Amens are, are fetching thousands, the low thousands, but they will go up. Now, here's my Irving Amen story. Ready for this? So Irving Amen, I, I I liked I liked his art. I liked I liked the human aspect of Irving Amen. And once I was in Boca Raton, I looked him up, and I was doing. Um, I, I I'm a campus rabbi, so I was in the campus Florida Atlantic in in Boca Raton, and I saw that Irving Amen lived in Boca Raton. I said, okay, I'm going to pay the artist a visit because I like to meet people and I'm a friendly man. So let's meet Irving Amen. So in between my rabbinating, I follow the address and it took me to a nursing home. Okay, so it wasn't a home address that I was randomly knocking on, but it was a nursing home. Okay, so there were some of the nurses there. I said, hello. Before the days of COVID, no covering the face, and um, I I said to them, "Do you do you know where Irving Amen is? I, I want to meet him. He's a, he's a, he hangs in the Smithsonian, hangs in the Met, he hangs in a lot of museums already in his lifetime." And they said, "Who? They didn't know who he was." So although he was he's a big celebrity in the art world and the nursing home, he was just another guy. So I said, "Okay, you know if you could." point me in the direction. I'd like to pay him a visit. And they said, sure, he hasn't had visitors in a long time. I said, okay, I'll do a mitzvah. So they gave me his, his room. I knocked on his door, opened up his door, and there is Irving Amen, this artist who's a, you know, quite well known. You can Google him. And he is surrounded with his art. He has art everywhere, gorgeous art, a trove of his art. So I said, Shalom. And we, I began to speak and I realized very quickly that he was in the middle to latter stages of Alzheimer's. So I'm feeling terrible, of course. This is it's always tragic to, to see what happens to a person. So I figured, let me try to make him happy. So I said, Tim, would you like to dance? He said, sure. 
So I took him by the hand and we just danced in the Zoom. We sang Havana Gila. We sang Hey Venu Shalom. And we just had, it was a surreal moment and, you know, no cameras, no nothing. It was me and Irving Amen dancing to Jewish music. And then he, he said, I really like that. Thank you. Can I give you one of these? And he goes down and hands me a painting. I said, no, you can't give me one of these. He doesn't know what he's doing. I'm not going to take a painting from him. He goes, no, I really want you to have it. I said, Irving, I just I just want to give you a hug. I don't need any of your paintings. And I gave him a hug. We danced a little more and I left. And that was it. And, uh, you know, that was it. it was, and unfortunately, a little while after he did pass away and, uh, you know, Ever since he passed away, his art has been going up and up, and uh, and that's Irving Amen. I came home. I thought, like, I met Irving Amen, and they knew we had a beautiful painting of a Torah skull. So, an artist like Irving Amen, that's a good investment. Hangs in museums. Was Jewish, so there he has Jewish subject matter. To be honest, I don't only buy Jewish subject matter if it's a Jewish artist, as long as, as it's appropriate, and that's a good investment. Another name. Uh, oh, so before the names, I want to I want to share with you a graph, and I don't have a graph that I can show you on the computer. So I'm going to use my hands to show you a graph of the value of artists, and it's important to know this graph because this will tell you whether now is a good time to invest or not. And it's actually quite similar to uh, anything on the stock market, particularly technology. Very, very similar. So in the beginning, an artist paints. Nobody knows about him or her. They sell a few pieces here and there. And uh, they may originally ask for thousands until they realize that uh, you can't sell for thousands because no one's promoting you and no one knows that you exist. So if you want to sell your art purely on the quality of how nice your painting is. So fortunately or, or unfortunately today, we can't go to China and get beautiful quality paintings made by technically proficient artists for a few hundred bucks. Okay. It's a little bit of a secret. You could, you could go on their websites. You could have a portrait made. So why would anyone buy your art if, if not for the fact that you're actually a name brand? And, and that's, that's, it's, it's a, it's a pity. It's, it's a pity because there are artists that are incredibly talented, but because they've never been promoted, their art is not worth a lot of money. And it's also a pity if I may say so that some artists are selling for a lot of money and people are paying a lot and it's not going to, I don't believe it's going to stand the test of time, but because it was promoted, uh, there is name recognition. So an artist in the beginning doesn't sell. And then something happens in their career and they take off. Now, what, what happened? They were promoted. They ended up on the cover of a prestigious magazine. That's also great for business. And, and if you're an artist, you should offer your stuff constantly because eventually they're going to use it if, it if it's decent. Um, you found a, a benefactor. That's another way for art to suddenly shoot up. I know an artist that was a very good artist, actually, but no one knew about them. And then a very wealthy family discovered them and became their patron. And then once... A, once that happens, oh, wow, this famous family, the Vanderbilts are by them. Okay. And all of a sudden, that give pre get, gives prestige to the art. And the art shoots up. And then everyone holds on for dear life. Oh, let's buy it. And, and it just becomes worth more and more. If it's within the artist's lifetime, there's an overwhelming chance that that art is going to dip and probably dip by a lot. It's not going to hold its value now. It may go back up, but for now, it, 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 there was excitement. But the excitement is going to wear out. You know why? Because you're still alive. And if somebody is willing to pay top dollar, says so an artist, well, you want in because it's your work, so you're going to paint more copies of it. So soon, 
people say, why should I spend 10,000 buying it from you when I can go to the artist and get it for 2,000? So it doesn't, it doesn't stay up. Now, there are some artists that make deals with galleries or brokers that they are not allowed to sell art directly to the customer. It has to go through them. Unfortunately, a lot of, not a lot, but a good number of artists don't have that kind of integrity. And if somebody hands them under the table three, $4,000, they'll paint for that person because that's more than they're, they're getting from the broker or from the gallery. So they're going to make more money. And the person buying it is going to spend less money. Anyhow, I, I know I'm getting very technical here, but that was my goal. My goal was to get technical in this last class. So the art is going to shoot up, but it will go down. And if you get very excited that it's an investment, be aware, you have to be aware where on that graph you are buying, knowing that you may be hitting a peak and it's going to go down. Okay. Next, the artist continues to paint. Now, it's not a, a flash in the pan artist, but now people are beginning to know about them. Now, we mentioned an equation a few, a few classes ago that a good artist should paint usually between one and two paintings a month. Better two paintings a month. So you should get about you know, between 12 and 24 paintings a year. In that way, you'll have at the end of a lifetime between six and 800 paintings. That's a really good sweet spot for art uh, to keep its value. If it's the kind of art that you could just like scratch out in a day, so the artist gets a little bit greedy, scratching out a ton of art, so then they're going to have thousands and thousands and the market will be saturated uh, and it won't be able to hold the prices. And if you don't paint enough art, then not enough people will hear about you. So again, your art will not keep its value because it won't grow in value because not enough people know heard about you. So you have to have enough that people heard about you, but not too much to oversaturate the market. Does that make sense? Okay, it's very technical, but that's how it is. And... Um, my experience with the really, really good artists are that that is the kind of art that they, that they paint. Uh, that's how long it takes them to paint uh, between one and two months. Uh, and they'll come up with something really, really beautiful. That's technically uh, valid. People will hear about them. Now today, when we have Instagram and we have Facebook and of course, we have email and we have all sorts of ways to get our work out there. So if that's the case today, anyone who uh, is in the art field, I'm not going to say should, they must make use of these venues of getting the word of mouth out there. You know why? Because everyone else is using them. And if you don't do it, then people won't hear of you. So the really good artists, we had an artist on last week, a lovely lady, uh, Esti Kiss, and I gave her a little bit of a gentle musser. I said, you've got to get your stuff on Instagram. Not that I'm a fan of Instagram. I don't use Instagram myself personally, but I, uh, Shabbat Lakam has an Instagram because we want people to keep Shabbos. So we've got to be on the radar somewhere. And that's what we use. And, you know, I haven't, I haven't gone to TikTok yet, but I'm sure that that's, that's going to be um, next on the agenda because <laughs> you got to use what is, what, what's, what's out there. Okay, let's continue the graph. So the art went uh, uh, quickly uh, escalated in price. Then it went down precipitously because it, it couldn't bear that kind of price. And then people began selling, selling. And then as the artist continued to paint, the the price sort of leveled off. Now, where it leveled off is important. Did it level off at 200 or 2,000? Because it's from there that it will continue to grow. Then, if the artist continues to paint, it will then creep slowly upward 
the rest of their life. That's how it works. Obscurity, sudden fame, reality sets in, then steady growth. Then the artist passes away. Now, very often, not always, not always, but very often when the artist passes away, especially if they're known, their art will then increase in value. Now, we know this as sort of like a rule of law, but it's not. There are some artists who they're not famous enough for their passing to make an impact. Uh, a great example of an artist who passed away recently, whose art is a Jewish artist, whose art is selling very well. I'm going to show you this artist. Uh, let's see. Okay, so this artist's name is Holtz. His name is Isaac Holtz. Isaac Holtz. Let's see. Let's see if I can pull up this painting. Okay, again, it's... Um, these are blurry websites, but I'm going to try my best. Isaac Holt, he passed away about two years ago. Painted very traditional art. Can you see that? Singer and Ice Singer. It's actually a very clear painting. This is just a very blurry photo, but a, a, a very, very good artist. And his art, I would say, doubled since he passed away. Uh, so an artist passes away, their art goes up. Does it stay up? It does not. Again, I'm not speaking about Van Gogh. I'm not speaking about uh, Rembrandt. I'm talking about a good artist, maybe a very good artist. They pass away. Their, their art goes up. It spikes. And then it goes back down. But very often, it will land higher than it was before they passed away. So if it was a graph, it would look like this. Here we go. This is just a very amateurish way of doing it. Uh, obscurity, spike, drop, steady growth, passes away, spike, smaller drop than growth, and very often steady growth. So you have to know where, where the artist is. Now, I'm going to give you a, a, a good name. There's an artist that I have a number of his paintings, and this artist had this exact, this exact uh, uh, pattern. His name is Tully Filmus. Tully, T-U-L-L-Y, Filmus, F-I-L-M-U-S. He lived, he's a Russian artist that moved to America. He has a son who's an artist as well. And this was the Tully Filmus story. Obscurity spiked like crazy, went down precipitously, passed away, went up, and now uh, when there's a film is, that comes up to auction, you'll have 20 people looking at it. And you'll get, for a nice film, is anywhere between two and five or 6,000, which is nice. Sometimes, you know, we, we have these visions of grandeur, like million-dollar painting. That That is like, a, that is... It's not one in a million. It's even less. Let's just not, not not even go there. That's those aren't the levels that we have to worry about. We're not worried about the crazy Sotheby's and Christie's. We're talking about again an artist going from three hundred to three thousand. You know, one thousand to seven thousand. That wouldn't you be happy if you made seven times your investment and enjoyed it? Right? Wouldn't that make you happy? Seven times that that's that's a great profit. So. You know, and 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 I think it's it's important because art in a certain way is also like gambling, and you know you can invest in an art an artist and an artist could go down. Um, something else I should mention that when you buy art, you have to expect that when you sell it, you're going to get a tremendous devaluation from the money that you spend for it. Because you're paying a gallery premium, you were the one who wanted to buy it. You know, you know, 
selling it means you're a little bit desperate to let it go. You have to pay somebody a commission to sell it. And you probably paid a gallery uh, or an auction house a 23 or 25% commission to buy it. So if it's a thousand bucks, just do the math. If if a painting went for a thousand and you paid, let's say, a uh, an auction house 25% for the auction, so then now you really paid a thousand two hundred and fifty. Besides the shipping being another two hundred, so now it's one thousand four hundred and fifty, and then the tax and that will be another, you know, so one thousand five hundred and fifty. Now. I want to take the same painting that I paid a thousand and a year later, let's say a year later, I want to sell it. So let's say it didn't really move within the year. So the auction record will say that I spent a thousand bucks, even though in reality I spent on the, on the, on the commission, I spent on, uh, on the shipping, I spent on the decks, but the, the, the next buyer will see that you spent a thousand bucks. So, when you give it to an auction to sell for you, the auction's going to say, well, we're going to take a commission. Being an auction house is a lucrative business. It's lucrative, lucrative. It's crazy because an, uh, an, an auctioneer takes 25% from the buyer and the seller. So there's almost no investment on their part except, uh, you know, getting the word out. And today there are websites like, like live auctioneers uh, that, that do, do the promotion for you. You pay them a flat fee for the auction and, and when you sell it, you have to pay 25%. So instead of a thousand bucks, it's 750. So what really happened here is, is you ended up paying 1,500 plus and you're selling it for 750 if it didn't move. David, am I getting you depressed here? Like, how much is it to make money? Well, you know, I know that uh, it, it, People will say, well, don't tell me what it's worth. Tell me what you can sell it for. Right, 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 right. That's right. But the difference between artwork and gambling is uh, at least uh, you don't end up losing your shirt. You have a piece of art. That's right. That's right. Yeah, no, it's, yeah, it, it's, it is a gamble, but it's not like gambling. It's not like gambling. And, and I would even say what I tell everyone, when you, when you spend money on art, just buy something you would hang. Because if you don't have, if you can't sell it, you want to enjoy it. It if if you can't sell it, and it's sitting in your closet, then you just locked up money for no reason. So what did that help anyone? Okay, so we we spoke about a few a few different uh, ways of investing. Uh, let's recap, and then I'll remember things that I forgot. I'll take a few questions if you have. Uh, to recap, uh, you want to find an artist who hasn't already spiked. And you want don't want to, you want to not buy an artist on the spike. Uh, go for traditional art. Uh, d- don't get too cute. Again, if, if you like cute and you don't care about money, so then buy whatever you want. But if it means something to you to buy and to sell, and some people buy the art specifically because they want to sell it one day. So if that's the case, buy something that you will be able to sell. And tr- usually that's traditional art buy something that's being promoted by the by a gallery. That's really good. Buy art from a technically uh, proficient expert artist. That's important. Uh, the, the art you should be able to take one look at the work and say, wow, this this uh, artist is is really good. And if you're not sure uh, whether he is or not, then that's what people like me are here for. You can ask and I'll tell you, and I probably will know the name as well. And I'll, I may even know the history. And if not, then I'll do my research because uh, not all artists are the same, just like not all singers are the same. It's all it's all different. Um, buy something you're going to like. Uh, don't break the bank on, uh, on, on the frame. Framing is very, very expensive. Uh, I actually have a framing store, so we do it wholesale. I'm not making a plug for me, but in case you want, you could reach out to me. Uh, I, 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 one of the reasons that we do that is because um, when I have a piece of art myself, I want to frame it because I don't want to go to Michael's and spend, uh, I mean, I, I, I'm not bashing Michael's, but my goodness gracious, gracious me, I don't, has anyone ever framed anything in one of these craft stores? A nothing painting, a nothing painting could be seven, eight hundred bucks. 
can I depress you again, my my dear friends? You know what? You know what their cost is. I'll tell you because I know what my cost is. We use the same people. Even if it's a large painting, they didn't spend more than a hundred bucks on the frame. They didn't. Okay, you want to buy a liner inside the frame? That's another forty bucks. The 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 person doing the framing, they're twenty five an hour. A, a regular frame. And, and by the way, most frames are not going to be a hundred bucks. And if you have a small piece, I remember I had, I had a small piece once and they charged like six, seven hundred bucks. It was yay high. When I, when I look at it today, I can't believe I spent, they, they could not have spent more than 25, 30 bucks on the molding. And they, they charge 600 bucks. The mar, a lot of galleries, by the way, they start off selling art and they end up selling framing because they know framing is way more lucrative. So don't break the don't break the bank on, on framing. I think the first time I bought a litho, I spent like 25 bucks on a litho and 300 bucks on the frame. It's, it's crazy. You need to have a nice frame. Framing is important. Just like lighting is critical. It's vital, but uh, you can go overboard on the framing and it, it, it adds practically no value to the art. Practically. Now, if a gallery sells it, they'll, they'll add another few hundred bucks for the framing because that's what it costs them. But if you think the presentation will be worth more because it's framed, it's not really so. Usually these auction auctioneers, they crop out the frame and they just show you the actual piece. Uh, any, any questions? I threw a lot of information at you tonight. Uh, uh, what else can I tell you? I mean, I have questions about stuff that I have that I'm just wondering the value of. I mean, they're not, one is original, one is a signed poster, but they're both by Jewish artists. And um, yeah, like, I don't know. I, one of them, um, it's a, I don't know if I can share my screen, but it's it's a signed Judy Chicago poster. Um, and like, she's a pretty big name, but I don't know if, if like her signature on something like really brings up the value or how much a poster's worth. And then the other thing, and this is like a weird one. Um, it's um, the architect, Daniel Liebskin. He has like a shape that he draws okay. and it's like his logo and he drew it. And I like, I asked him to do it and he did it. So like, I have the provenance of knowing it's, it's that, but he like clearly didn't want me to resell it. So he asked me my name, wrote my name on it, wrote his name on it. So like the resale value probably goes down. Cause like, who am I to, you know, <laughs> my name on sign means nothing, but like, I have no idea how to value these things. So like, how do you even begin to, to value either, like a very weirdly unique, like scribble by like a well-known artist, or how do you value something that has a signature, but that's the only original element of it? Right. And, and I mean, I wish I could buy things that were, you know, five to $10,000 as you're suggesting. I just am not at that place financially right now. Totally. Totally. So um, if the artist is well-known, yeah. uh, it, it could add a hundred bucks. Mm -hmm. That's what you're talking about. Uh, there are posters there are yeah. people who collect posters and yeah. some posters have uh, have a certain value, especially if they're old and they're not a reprint and they would never, but. And they're, they're both Jewish artists, by the way. Sorry. I don't know if I said that they're both, they're yeah. both Jews. Yeah. Judy okay. Chicago. Uh, yeah. So the, the simple answer is the, the, they're, they're not worth an awful lot. Yeah. If you had something by a Dali, you know, Dali, for example, Salvador Dali, and he, wrote on a napkin, uh, you know, because you didn't want to pay, so you wrote a napkin. Yeah. So, you know, that, that that's worth a, a few hundred bucks. Mm -hmm. If you had a drawing by Dolly and some some provenance, that could be worth, you know, a thousand bucks. If it's on a napkin, if it's on a piece of paper, it's worth much more. Mm -hmm. um, you know, in, unless you specifically want, if, if you put it on eBay, you'll get 20 bucks. Yeah. Uh, it, it, it it's it's much more niche. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, but I'm, I'm glad you asked me that question because you reminded me in general when it comes to art, if you want to invest. So there is a, a number of different mediums. So a poster is, is like a print, but there is such a thing called gouache, acrylic, watercolor, oil, uh, sketching. So the, usually oil and acrylic are sort of the same category. I, I clump them together. Uh, watercolor is different. Now, watercolor paintings are very, they're very hard to, to, to make. Uh, watercolor watercolor uh, paint spreads and uh, 
Oh, I have a meeting now. One second. What are called thing spreads, and um, it has a way of uh, messing up the art. So it's very hard to paint watercolor. However, watercolor art is worth far less than oil paints. So again, if you're going, to, if you love watercolor, or if it's a specifically a very important artist, so then you know watercolor, or sketching, whatever. But if you, if all things being equal, you want to go for oil. What about oil on canvas versus oil on board? Oil on board is worth a little bit more. So I go for oil on board. Does size make a difference in art? Absolutely. Absolutely. What is it? Right? The larger the painting, the more expensive. And by the way, that is as it should be. So people think, oh, it's probably not, you know, it just doesn't make a difference, the quality of the work. Assuming the quality is the same, a large painting is worth more than a smaller painting. And um, yeah, okay, so on wood, oil, large, uh, preferably dated would be great. If you really, if the artist is really good, there's one of the mo most famous artists in the world actually is a dear friend of mine, uh, a fellow by the name of Michael Chavel. I have a great story with him as well. Michael Chevelle, uh, he, they say he's going to be one of the first artists in his lifetime who is going to, uh, uh, his paintings are going to be a million dollars. And um, I found Michael Chevelle uh, in someone's attic. It was just a, a beautiful story. He had painted rabbis when he first came over from Russia. And, uh, and then I, I, went, I looked him up online and he's huge. He's sells in Park West, just a really important artist. So yeah, there are videos about him. So I thought, hey, I'd love to, you know, reach out to him. You know, I'm friendly with these kind of people. So I, I looked him up and it turns out he lived 20 minutes away from my house. So I called him up. And I said, Michael, Michael Chevelle, yeah. My name is Rabbi Klatsko. Uh, I have a few of your pieces. I love your pieces. Would you allow me to take you to lunch? So he, Michael Chevelle said, um, yeah, you know, we schmoozed a little bit. And then he said, but I don't drive. I said, no problem, I'll come pick you up. So I went to his house and and I brought him to Muncie, New York, which is where I live. We went to a few different steak places. They were all closed. So we ended up going to a dairy place. We had a great, great schmooze. Um, I, um, he came to my house. I ended up giving him a beautiful drawing, an etching from the Holocaust as a present. I thought it was a very nice thing. And we gave him a nice hot challah that my wife had just baked. And then I said, I have a favor to ask you. He said, sure, what do you want, Rabbi? I said, I have these pieces that you painted years ago. Would you be kind enough to sign the back of them and give them a, a title? Because if the artist signs the back and gives them a title, it's more value. He said, I'll do better. I, I painted these years ago. Is it okay? I want to bring a few of them to my house and touch them up, freshen them up. I said, really, you would do that? And, and he did that. And he brought them and he titled them all on the back. And, uh, and um, it, it was it's just, it was a tremendous honor. And uh, unfortunately, one of them was in my fire just now, but I was, I was honored to have, I, it was hanging in my house. I just, Michael Chevelle is a buddy and, and, I, and I invite him for Shabbat and you just want to come close because they're creative and they've had passion and that's just the way to go. Anyways, there's a lot to be said. I have another meeting. Uh, I hope this was helpful. If you want more information or if you want uh, if you're interested in investing in art, definitely reach out to me. I will try to guide you properly. I'm not a prophet, so I could be wrong, but no one is. But I, I, I think I have a good a finger on the pulse of uh, the industry. So my number, here we go, is 212 Shabbat. It's so easy. 212 Shabbat. And that spells 212-742-2228. 212 Shabbat. You just reach out to me. And if you have an art you want me to look at and try to appraise for you, I'll do it free of charge. I'm happy to, to help out. And meanwhile, I wish you all a wonderful evening. If you've been with us since the beginning, whether on YouTube or Facebook or Zoom, I appreciate that. I know it's sort of a niche kind of uh, class. I don't know if I'm going to do it again, but uh, it'll now live uh, in 
uh, for posterity on uh, YouTube so you can review it. You're welcome, Allison. Thank you so much for watching and uh, have a good night, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Rabbi. You're welcome. Take care. Have a good night, everyone.